thing. Okay, good, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining uh, our session this morning. Uh, for today's session, we are going to do a revision of term one and term two's work. So today I'm going to revise momentum as well as the Doppler effect. Okay, so we've already gone through these uh, topics before, but today is a summary of what we have done already. And in the next session that you have, uh, you will do a revision of vertical projectile motion and work and kinetic energy. And the session that follows, we will start with electrostatics and um, the topics that you will be covering in term three at school. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen with you now and we can begin. Okay, so I'm just checking that you can all hear me and you can see my, my slide, my first slide. Okay, can, can, you, can you see my slide and can you all hear me clearly? Yes, we can see the slide and we can hear you clearly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so welcome to the grade 12 physical science revision session. And I'm Ashla Pele, and today we're doing momentum and the Doppler effect. Okay, so let's start with momentum. Uh, I just want to um, recommend that as we're going through this, I, I cannot see uh, the chat, so you're welcome to type in the chat or to raise your hand there. Uh, and as we go through, um, through the explanations, I will ask questions. Uh, while we can't have the interactive session, you must try to answer it um, when I ask the question, okay? Even if you're not uh, saying it out loud. Okay, so the definition of momentum. So linear momentum of a particle is a vector quantity, and it is equal to the product of the mass of the particle and its velocity. Okay, because sometimes they will ask you in the test or exam uh, to state or explain what momentum is, and then you need to know how to do it. Okay, and the symbol for momentum is small letter P. Okay, and it's got the arrowhead above the P because it is a vector quantity. So the momentum of an object of mass M moving at velocity V is, and so at this point, you already know P is equal to M times V. Okay, so if P is equal to M times V and M is mass in kilograms and V is the velocity in meters per second, what is the SI unit for momentum? Okay, the SI unit is just kilogram meter per second. Okay, so here's our equation uh, for momentum. P is equal to mv. So from there we can see that momentum is directly proportional to the mass and momentum is directly proportional to the velocity. And we know that if something's directly proportional, it means that if the one quantity increases, the other also increases in proportion. Okay, so a small car that's traveling at the same velocity as a big truck will have a smaller momentum than the truck. Okay. So the smaller the mass, the smaller the momentum for a fixed velocity. So if they have the same velocity, the smaller mass, 
will have the smaller momentum. And if the mass is constant, so they have the same mass, then the greater the velocity, the greater the momentum. So these are all important concepts. Okay, and what is the direction of the momentum? Momentum is equal to mass times velocity, and mass is a scalar quantity. It doesn't have any direction. So the momentum will have the same direction as the velocity, because the velocity is the vector quantity. Okay, and then we went on to Newton's second law of motion. Now you all know Newton's second law as F is equal to M times A. Okay, that is Newton's second law. And we've shown previously how we can derive the equation in terms of momentum. So this is Newton's second law of motion in terms of momentum. And it says the net or resultant force acting on an object is equal to the rate of change of momentum. So the net force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. And mathematically, you can write Newton's second law out. So how would you write the rate of change of momentum? Okay, so we would write it like that. Rate of change means the change in time. So the net force is equal to delta P over delta T. The change in momentum divided by the change in time. Okay, when we're talking about momentum, an important concept is collisions and also impulse. So the picture you're seeing is a tennis ball hitting the racket. During a collision, a large force acts for a short time delta T. Okay, so it's a very large force acting over a very short time interval. And since F is equal to delta P over delta T, which we've just seen, that's Newton's second law, we can relate the change of momentum to the force applied. So we can just rewrite that equation as F delta T is equal to delta P. Okay, so that F delta T is called the impulse. Okay, we call F delta T the impulse. So the change in momentum equal to the impulse, F delta T. Okay, so what about the total momentum? What if we have more than one object in a system? How would we find the total momentum? The total momentum of a system is calculated by the vector sum of the momenta of all the objects or particles in the system, okay? So if you have a system with N objects, then the total momentum is P total is equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3 on and on till plus Pn. And we can rewrite that in math notation using the sigma sign. Okay, I should just, so this sign here, this is sigma. It means the sum of or add all the PIs. So this is very important. So if you look at this equation for the total momentum, you can see all the arrowheads above the P. So that means it's a vector sum. So remember a vector has a magnitude as well as a direction. So when we are adding, this is not just algebraic addition, it's a vector addition. Okay, so you are adding it, you are adding vectors. Okay, so conservation of momentum. The total momentum of an isolated system is constant. So that's one way of saying the momentum is conserved. The total momentum of an isolated system is constant. Another way of stating the conservation of momentum is to say, in the absence of an external force acting on a system, momentum is conserved. So when I'm saying 
in the absence of an external force, I'm saying it is an isolated system. Okay, so both of these are equivalent. Okay, so we need to understand what an isolated system is. So in the diagram here, you have the dashed circle. Okay, now that dashed circle is our system. So everything inside the circle belongs to a system. So inside here, we have these three objects and these objects can exert forces on each other. So they are called internal forces because they are acting between objects within the system. And there, is, there are no forces that are outside of the system acting on the system. Okay, so this is an isolated system. So you can have internal forces between objects in the system and momentum can be exchanged between objects in that system. But momentum is not changed between these objects and anything outside of the system. So this is an isolated system. Okay, so collisions. So in a collision between two objects, the total momentum is conserved if the system is isolated, okay? So if you have an isolated system, total momentum will be conserved. And the forces act only at the instant of collision and transfer momentum between the objects, okay? So at the moment of collision, there is a transfer of momentum. And the total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after collision. Well, that is same as conservation of momentum. So here is object A, and then it has some momentum, which is mass of A multiplied by the velocity of A. And we have object B, and object B has a momentum, which is mass of B times velocity of B. Then they collide, so there's a little collision here. And after the collision, A has some momentum, mass of A times the different velocity of A. And B has a new momentum, which is the mass of B multiplied by the new velocity of B. So you can see the directions have changed. And in this notation, instead of using uh, v initial and V final, we're just using the prime sign for, for velocity after. So if we had to write out this equation for the conservation of momentum, which says the momentum before collision is equal to the momentum after collision, this is the equation we would have. So the momentum of A before collision plus momentum of B before collision is equal to the momentum of A after the collision plus momentum of B after the collision. Okay, there are no other objects acting here, no other forces, so this is an isolated system. And in an isolated system, momentum is conserved. Okay, so the conservation of energy in collisions. Okay, so the total mechanical energy. So total mechanical energy means the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. Now in a collision, that mechanical energy it may or may not be conserved. So what does that mean? It means that if we have an elastic collision, then the total mechanical energy is conserved. So when you have a collision, if that collision is an elastic collision, the total mechanical energy is conserved. If you have an inelastic collision, then the total mechanical energy is not conserved, some of the energy is lost. So if we have a look at the drawing here, here's object A with some initial velocity VA, you have object B with initial velocity VB and they approach each other. Then they collide, so here's a collision between A and B. 
after the collision, A goes off with some velocity V prime A and B goes off with some velocity V prime B. Now look at the length of these green arrows relative to before the collision, because the masses are not changing. And you'll see that it's the same because this is an elastic collision in the total, mechanical energy is conserved. If we look at this next picture, which shows an inelastic collision, you can see that now the green arrows are shorter or they have changed from before the collision, which tells us that the in an elastic collision, the mechanical energy is not conserved. So some energy is lost in that collision. Okay, so what's important to know here is when we have these collisions, if we have an isolated system, the total momentum is conserved. So the momentum before collision will equal to the momentum after the collision. If the collision is elastic, then we will also have that the total mechanical energy is conserved. Okay, and in the calculations we're going to do, if they are all at the same along a horizontal surface, the potential energy is not changing. So when we talk about mechanical energy being conserved, it means that the kinetic energy before the collision is equal to kinetic energy after the collision. In an inelastic collision, then the mechanical energy is not conserved. Okay, and then last type of inelastic collision is completely inelastic collision. So that is when you have a collision and the objects stick together after the collision. So both of the objects have one final velocity, okay? So some of the total mechanical energy is lost and the energy lost is not destroyed. We know that from conservation of energy, we cannot create or destroy it, but we can convert it from one form to another. So in a completely inelastic collision, some of the total mechanical energy is converted to heat or internal motion or the vibration of the stuck together system. So the energy, before the collision is different to the energy after collision. Okay, so that is the summary of momentum. So are there any questions on momentum? So I just wanna answer any theory questions. We're going to do uh, calculations and examples afterwards. Is there anything that you want to ask me about momentum at this stage? No, you're fine. Okay, so. Uh, sorry, I didn't get that, Zwandile. Saying it seems like everybody's quiet. Okay. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, go over the Doppler effect. And uh, as we've done now, and when we're done with that, then we're going to go through calculations on momentum and Doppler effect. Okay, so let's just do a, a, a revision of the Doppler effect. Okay, so. Here's the first one is the Doppler effect with sound. Okay. So can you remember, can you state the Doppler effect? Because in the next questions we're gonna do, they ask us many times to state the Doppler effect. Okay, so for sound, the Doppler effect is the change in frequency or pitch of the sound detected by a listener because the sound source and the listener have different velocities relative to the medium of sound propagation. Okay, so remember, you have a source which is emitting the sound and that source will have a certain frequency. And then you will have to have an observer or a listener who is receiving the sounds or who can hear it or detect it. And then the sound is traveling from the source to the listener through some medium of sound propagation. 
So if we have a, an ambulance that's uh, driving through and, and the person is listening to it, then the medium of sound propagation is air. The sound is traveling through air. Okay. And what is the formula that gives us the relationship between the frequency emitted by the source and the frequency that is measured by the listener? Okay, so this is the equation for Doppler effect. FL is equal to V plus or minus VL divided by V plus or minus VS. All of that is multiplied by FS. Okay, so let's just write that equation out again. And we need to know what each of these symbols mean. So the F is for frequency. Subscript L is for the listener, okay? And subscript S is for the source. So FL is the frequency of the listener and it's measured in Hertz. FS is the frequency of the source also measured in Hertz. V is the speed of sound. So it's the speed, it will be in meters per second. So the speed, of the sound in the medium of sound propagation. Okay, and then V here is sound, but subscript L means listener and subscript S is for the source. So the speed of the listener in meters per second and the speed of the source also in meters per second. Okay, so we understand, we know the equation and we know what all the variables mean. How do we know when to use plus and when to use minus in the numerator? Okay, so if the listener, so VL means speed of the listener. If the listener is moving towards the source, then you will use a plus sign, okay? If the listener is moving away from the source, you will use the minus sign. Okay, and what about the denominator? Or well, how do we know when to use plus and when to use minus for the speed of the source. Okay, do you know it? Okay, so if the source is moving away from the listener, then you will use a plus sign, okay? And if the source is moving towards the listener, you will use the minus sign. Okay, so that is all that we need to know about this equation, and then we should be able to, to do the calculations. Okay, so Doppler effect for sound. Okay, we have also seen that you can experience the Doppler effect with light. Okay, so this is just the summary now relative to the middle of the visible spectrum. So here is the visible spectrum. Okay, so these are the colors that we can see. So it's visible to us. And the middle of it is approximately there. So relative to the middle, you can see on this end, we have like around 400 nanometers and increasing. So this is the wavelength increasing up to 700, 740 nanometers. Okay, so red here, is with the longer wavelength and the blue colors are towards the shorter wavelengths. And so the longer wavelengths are more red. Okay, they are redder. And the shorter wavelengths are bluer. You know that frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So if you have a long wavelength, you will have a lower frequency, okay? And if you have a short wavelength, then you will have a high frequency. So on the side here with the long wavelengths and the low frequency is the red shifts or the redder light. On this side, we have shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies and it's more blue. So we call shifts towards longer wavelengths red shifts because it's closer to the color red. 
and the shift towards shorter wavelengths is blue shifts. It's closer to the color blue. Okay, so what is the Doppler effect for light? Okay, it is the change in frequency or wavelength of a light wave detected by an observer because the light source and the observer have different velocities relative to the medium of light propagation. Okay, so not sound propagation, we're talking about light. So it's light propagation and it's not the pitch of the sound, it's the frequency or the wavelength. Okay, so if we are talking about the Doppler effect with respect to light, uh, we talk about the stars, okay, the light coming from the stars. So here's the summary. If a star is moving towards the earth, and you can see which color we've written towards in, then when the star is moving towards the earth, the wave fronts of the light waves are compressed closer together. Okay, so they're getting, the wavelengths are going to be getting shorter. So the perceived wavelength of the light waves decreases. So the wavelength is decreasing or it's getting shorter. So then what happens to the frequency? If the frequency is inversely proportional to the wavelength, when the wavelength is shorter, the frequency is bigger or a higher frequency. So the frequency increases. And what about the energy of the photons? The energy is directly proportional to the frequency. If you have a high frequency, then that means it's high energy photons. If you have a low frequency, then you have low energy. Okay, so when the star is moving towards the earth, the wavelength is shorter, the frequency increases and the energy also increases. So the light will become more blue or it will be blue shifted. Okay, so if the star is moving towards the earth, it's gonna be blue shifted. Okay, so these are important um, concepts that you have to uh, learn and remember. Okay, what about if the star is moving away from the earth? When the star is moving away from the earth, it's going to be the opposite of this one. So here it is. If the star is moving away from the earth, then the wave fronts of the light waves are further apart from each other. That means that the wavelength of the light waves increases. The wavelength increases. So what happens to the frequency? If the wavelength increases, the frequency decreases. And if the frequency decreases, what happens to the energy? The energy will also decrease. Okay, and so the light will become more red, or we say that it is red shifted. Okay, so that is the explanation for the Doppler effect with respect to light. Okay, so now that we've covered all the theory that we need to know, uh, we are ready to do some calculations. Okay, so do you have any questions for me on any of these slides that we've done? Doppler effect or momentum? No questions? Okay, so I'm just going to log on to my other hey. device. Yep. Here's a question. Okay, yes. So please, can you go over the uses of the Doppler effect? I'm not sure what they mean by this, but I said, oh, can you okay, okay. Um, oh, okay. That's not a problem. Let me, um, I will, I'll, I'll do that now. The person's asking about the, the and doctor the, flow the, meters, yes? The learner is saying this question was asked in an exam. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to um I just have to I'm gonna just I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I'm gonna bring up the other slides uh, where we've done this. Okay, so 
I'm going to answer. Are there any other questions? So then I can also know which slides to open. Okay, let me just open the... And I'm going to share my screen. Um, Doppler effect. Okay, so here's the one. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can oh. see this. Yeah, we okay. can see the slide. Thank you. Um, sorry. Okay, so here is one of the applications of the Doppler effect. Uh, explain how it is used to determine the direction of flow of blood in veins. Uh, so there's an instrument called the Doppler flow meter, uh, which can transmit ultrasonic waves into a person's body. And then these sound waves are reflected by the tissue, the bone and the blood. And we measure that by the flow meter. So if the blood flow is being measured in an artery, for example, then the moving blood cells will reflect the transmitted wave. And then depending on how these cells are moving, the reflected sound waves will be Doppler shifted. Okay, so if the blood is moving towards the flow meter, then it will be Doppler shifted to a higher frequency. And if the blood's moving away from um, the detector, then you're going to have a lower frequency. And in that way, you can determine which direction the blood is flowing in the veins. So this is the one um, example of that. And then the use of ultrasound equipment in medicine, it's called sonography or ultrasonography. So remember that ultrasound is all the sound waves with the frequency that are greater than 20,000 hertz, okay? If it's greater than 20,000 hertz, then those are ultrasound waves. And then the waves that are from, from 20 hertz up to 20,000, we can hear those, then that's just called sonic. And then the waves that are less than um, uh, 20 hertz are called infrasonic waves. Okay, does this answer your question on, on the Doppler effect, the application of it? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, nope. Okay, so then I'm going to... I'm just going to log in with my other device so that we can do the calculations and I can write. Okay.
Okay. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that feedback. Okay. So, can you now see my screen on this question and you can hear me clearly? Yes, we can see your screen and I can hear you clearly. Thank you. Okay, so let's get on with an example. Okay, that's the best way to know if we understand this. So here is an example on momentum. And it says, ball P of mass 0 0.16 kilograms, moving east at a speed of 10 meters per second, collides head on with another ball Q of mass 0 0.2 kgs, moving west at a speed of 15 meters per second. After the collision, ball P moves west at a speed of five meters per second, as shown in the diagram below. Ignore the effects of friction and the rotational effects of the balls. Okay, so we have a picture showing us before the collision and after the collision. And in the momentum questions, and then at the, on the right, you can see the directions, north, east, south, and west. Sometimes we will give us directions like these, north, east, south, and west. And sometimes they would say to the left or to the right, or moving up or down, okay? Uh, so we, when, we, when we are answering the question, we will just use the same notation. So in this case, they said, ball P is moving east. So when they ask us for the velocity, we will give the magnitude. And when we give the direction, it will be term in terms of north, east, south, and west. Okay, so here's the first one. Define the term momentum in words. Okay, so uh, when we're doing these examples, you all need to have your calculators with you and your pen and paper. So as we're doing it, you're also going to, um, to solve these problems. Okay, we're doing it together. So let's do the first one. So 4.1, define the term momentum in words. Can you do that? Can you write it down or are you saying it to yourself so that you know? So the momentum of an object is I'm going to say is the product of its mass and velocity, because P is equal to MV, okay? Or you could just write out the definition as we saw in the slide. It is a vector quantity, blah, 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 the whole story, okay? So that is the first one. Momentum of an object is the product of its mass and velocity. So 4.2.1, calculate the velocity of ball Q after the collision. Okay, how are we going to do that? 4.1, oh, sorry. 4.2.1. So we have ball P and we have ball Q. We know both the masses, we know both the initial velocities, we know the one final velocity. We are asked to calculate the second final velocity. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is choose which direction is positive. So I'm going to say, take east as positive. Okay, so you have to say that. Okay, so that's the first thing. And then how, how do I solve this? Now we've only got these two balls. And so I'm going to say, ah, oh, this momentum has to be conserved. So I write that as the sum of P initial is equal to the sum of P final. Or you could say momentum before is equal to the momentum after. Okay, so let's write out the equation, so I'll, let's start right here. So what's the initial momentum? The initial momentum is the mass of P 
multiplied by the velocity of P, and then I'm calling it I, instead of writing MPI, VPI, okay? Plus, I also have Q. Uh, how is Q written as a capital? So it's M Q V Q initial. Those are the only two. That must equal to the mass of P times V of P. Oh, sorry, P after the collision or final plus mass of Q. V of Q final. Okay, so that's the first part. And this is the physics that we did now. We, this is, we were able to write this because we knew of conservation of momentum. And the steps that come afterwards is all the maths, okay, which is also very important. Well, actually the directions or the sign that you're gonna put in is also important. Okay, so we know most of them except VQ, which is what we're trying to find. So you can go ahead of me and start filling in all these values. Okay, so the mass of P is 0 0.16. And VP is 10. Oops, sorry. Ten meters per second, and it's a plus ten. Plus the mass of Q is zero point two. What is VQ? It is fifteen, but it is minus fifteen. Okay, that is equal to zero point one six times. VP final is minus five and MQ is 0 0.2 and VQF is what I'm trying to find, okay? So once you have this step, you can, you can do the rest. So do it quickly and tell me what answer you get. Okay, is this what you got? Did you get minus three? So that is equal to three meters per second. Or maybe I should write it as ms to the minus one yeah, for meters per second. And the direction, I said take east to be positive and my answer is negative. So the direction is west. Okay, I hope you got that right. So that's the answer to calculate the velocity of ball Q after the collision. Okay, so that's the velocity after the collision. The next question, oops. The next question is, calculate the magnitude of the impulse on ball P during the collision. What is the magnitude of the impulse on ball P during the collision? Okay, can you do that? So that's 4.2.2. So we're asking us to find the impulse on ball P, so we write the equation out as F net delta T is equal to, you can write it out as delta P, and then we can rewrite that as M VF minus M 
the I. Or I'm, I'm writing it out in this first example that we're doing, so we won't write it out in the following ones. You could also just write it as M into VF minus VI. Okay? So if you are familiar with it and you're just writing the third step initially, that's fine. Okay, so that is what the impulse is equal to. Let's substitute the values. What is the mass? The mass is 0 0.16. The final velocity was minus 0.5 minus the initial velocity, which is 10. And then if you put that in, you end up getting an answer of minus 2.4. But what is the answer now? What is the impulse of force multiplied by? It's just equal to 2.4. What is what is the unit for the impulse if it is F delta T? What is the unit for F? Force is just in newtons and delta T is second. So this is the answer, 2.4 newton second. Okay, so that's how we answer that question. Okay, the magnitude of the impulse on that four. Okay, so I hope you're happy with that. Let's move on to another example, also on momentum. Okay, let's look at this one. Okay, a delivery vehicle of mass 5,500 kilograms moving at a velocity V to the right, collides head on with a car of mass 2,000 kilograms moving at 30 meters per second in the opposite direction, so to the left. Immediately after the collision, the car and the truck move at 10 meters per second and six meters per second respectively to the right. Okay, so when they say the car and truck move at 10 and six respectively, it means the car was first, so it's 10 for the car, the truck was second and the second one was six. So the car is 10 meters per second and the truck is six meters per second. Okay, so here's the famous question state the principle of conservation of linear momentum in words. So can you do that? What is the principle of linear, conservation of linear momentum? The total linear momentum, the total, linear momentum and I'm saying here in a closed system or you would say in an isolated system remains constant. So when you're saying that it remains constant, it means it does not change or it is conserved. It's all the same thing. Okay, but what's important is at this stage, when they ask you this question, if anyone asks you at any time, you would be able to, to explain it or to state it. You don't have to go and uh, learn it just cramming before the exam. Okay, so what is the um, principle of conservation of linear momentum? The total linear momentum in a closed system remains constant. Calculate the magnitude of the velocity of the delivery vehicle before the collision, okay? So we have the two vehicles, we have the two masses, we have the velocities, the final velocities, and we have one initial velocity. And we have to calculate the other initial velocity. So like we did in the previous example, you first choose which direction is going to be positive. So here they say 
left or right. So I'm going to say take to the right. Okay, so take right to be positive. Okay, so that's the first thing. So in this example as well, we're going to say that the initial momentum must equal to the final momentum. And when you write it out now, so in this example here, it's not P and Q, there is a delivery vehicle, which they're calling a truck afterwards and a car. So you can refer to it as truck and car, or you can refer to it as object one and object two, or whatever you want to call it, right? So I'm going to just say, so we have M, let's call it one. M1, V1 initial plus M2, V2 initial must equal to M1, V1 final plus M2, V2 final. Okay, so what is M1? M1 is 5,500. And what is V1? That is what we're trying to find. Okay, we're trying to find the initial velocity. Plus M2 is 2,000. And V2 is negative 30. Okay. And that must equal to 5,000 times, what's the final velocity? It's plus six, or you can just write it as six, plus 2,000 plus 10. Okay, once you have this, you've got all these numbers now, you can uh, use your calculator and solve it. So here we've got, 5,500 V1 is equal to 113,000, I think it is. And if you solve, you'll get V1 equal to 20.55 meters per second. Okay, did you get that? Well done if you did. Okay, so that's the first part of the question, calculating the initial um, velocity of the delivery vehicle. Okay. The next question is, if the collision lasts 0 0.2 seconds, calculate the force the car exerts on the delivery vehicle during the collision. Okay. So in these examples, when you are looking at these examples here, you can see what's happening. Initially, they are approaching each other and then there is a collision and afterwards they both move to the right. Okay, so when you know what the initial direction was, then there's the collision and the final di direction, you will know what direction the force was that acted on the object. Okay, but let's see, collision is 0 0.2 seconds. What is the force the car exerts on the delivery vehicle? Okay, so can you do it already before me? We know the equation is F net or just N. I'm gonna just write it as N for F net. Delta T is equal to Okay, so I'm not going to write the whole thing out like that. I'll just write it as M. Oh, maybe I should write MVF minus MVI. Okay, so we're trying to find the net force, F net. 
the time is 0 0.2 seconds. And then what is the change? So we wanna see what is the change in the momentum of the delivery vehicle. Okay, so I'm going to use M equal to 5,500. And then in here, instead of writing it again, I'm gonna just say VF, which is six minus 20 point. Are you okay with me writing it like that? MVF minus VI, okay? And if you do that, you will get minus 80,025. And then Fnet or Fn is going to equal to minus 80,025 divided by 0 0.2. And what do you get? you get negative 400, 125, a very, very large force. And remember, that's the whole thing about impulse. It's a huge force, a large force that acts over very short time intervals, 0 0.2 seconds. So this net force is that. So it means that the force is 400, 125 Newton to the left, okay? So even if we used the, uh, the change in momentum and use the details of the car uh, to get the force, you would know this direction to the left just by understanding what happened in the question here, okay? Okay, so are you happy with that? In the meantime, I'll just get ready for the next question. We'll do one, another one on momentum. Okay, no questions. So I'm going to just move on to the next example. Uh, should we do this next example or do we take a five minute break now? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just do this example. And then after this example, we'll just have a five minute break. So here's another question on momentum. So we have two balls, okay, X and Y. So ball X of mass 10 kilograms is moving eastwards to, with a velocity of two meters per second. It collides elastically with another ball Y of mass two kilograms, which was moving with an unknown velocity Vy. Okay, that's in the di diagram here. Immediately after the collision, ball X comes to rest. So V is equal to zero. And ball Y moves eastwards with a kinetic energy of 36 joules. Okay, so that's an interesting question. So the first question is, Explain the meaning of the term elastic collision. Okay, elastic collision. So can you take a moment? I'm gonna write it out here. Do you know what it is? What is an elastic collision?
Okay. An elastic collision is a collision in which both the total momentum and and what else? The total mechanical energy. Or if you want to, you can say kinetic energy, okay? Because in your case, it will always be that. And total mechanical energy. A collision in with both, not is, are conserved. Okay, so what is an elastic collision? It's a collision in which both the total momentum and the total mechanical energy are conserved. Okay, so now this interesting example, calculate the velocity Vy. Okay, so if we look at this problem, we have both the masses, we have one initial velocity. They ask us to calculate the second initial velocity. And for final velocities, we only have one, but for ball Y, they've given us the kinetic energy, the final kinetic energy. So we can use this final kinetic energy to calculate the final velocity. When we have the final velocity, then we can use our conservation of momentum to solve the problem. Okay. So that's what we are going to do now. We're going to say the 36 joules of kinetic energy for ball Y, what is its velocity? Okay, that's the first step. And so if you are doing this and you're working faster than me, when you found that velocity, put it into the equation for conservation of momentum. Okay, so let's do that. So 4.2, the first thing we're going to do is, um, how do you write kinetic energy? EK, okay. So for kinetic energy, okay, I'll write it like that. So EK, but I can say EK final is equal to a half MV final squared, okay. And if I substitute the values, the final kinetic energy is 36 joules is equal to a half. The mass of Y is two kilograms. And VF squared is what I'm trying to find. Okay. And so half times two is just one. So V if this is the subscript, so let's write properly. Vf is equal to the square root of 36. And the correct answer to that is plus or minus six meters per second. Okay, uh, so negative six multiplied by negative six will give me 36 and six times six is 36. But how do I know what the direction is? Is it plus or minus? We already told here that it is going east, okay? So this is just six meters per second east. Okay, and then I should just say that I'm going to take east as positive, okay, take east as positive. So now that I, I know what the final velocity is, I can go ahead and find this initial velocity, Vy. I'm trying to find Vy. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to do this by writing my conservation of linear momentum equation. 
the initial momentum must equal to the final momentum. So how are we gonna do that? So we've got X and Y. So I can write it out as M X V X initial plus M Y V Y initial must equal to mx vx final plus my vy final okay so what is mx vx so this is just 10 and that's 2 plus my is 2 vy is what i'm trying to find that is equal to what's the final vx it's just 0 so this is 0 plus my is 2 and vy is 6 which we just calculated Okay, so we can easily solve for Vy now. So Vy is equal to two times six is 12 minus two times 10 is 20 divided by two. And you get negative four meters per second. And what does the negative sign mean? It means that Vy is equal to four meters per second. Now is it west, eh? You know what? Moving eastward, so this would now be west. Okay, so that's how we do that question. We first had to calculate what the veloc final velocity was because they had given us the kinetic energy. Okay, and then the balls were in contact with each other for 0 0.1 second during the collision. Calculate, calculate the magnitude of the force that ball X exerted on ball Y during the collision. Okay, so this again is, We've done a few examples now. So we are very good at it. So 4.3 F net delta T. Remember I'm writing this N, it's N-E-T, okay? Is equal to M, and we can write it as Vf minus Vi for the change in momentum. So F net, the time is 0 0.1 seconds. The mass is two, the final velocity is six minus, the initial velocity is four meters per second west. So that is negative four. And then you get 20. So then the net force, F net is equal to 20 divided by 0 0.1, which is equal to 200 Newtons. Okay. All right, calculate the magnitude of the force that ball X exerted on ball Y. So the magnitude is just 200 Newtons. Okay, do you have any questions on this part? Okay, so I'm gonna just stop here. I'm just waiting now if there's any questions. Okay, so we're gonna just have a short five minute break. And when we come back, we will do uh, an example on, um, on a completely inelastic collision. And then we'll do some examples on the Doppler effect. Okay.
So I'll see you now in five minutes.
Okay, um, I'm back. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen with these two trains and you can hear me clearly? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's carry on now. So this is an example where you have a goods train being assembled in a yard. Okay, so there are two cars here and it's labeled in the drawing. Car two of mass 92 times 10 to the three kilograms and moving with a velocity of 1.3 meters per second to the right collides with car one of mass 65 times 10 to the three kilograms that is moving to the right with a velocity of 0 0.8 meters per second. The two cars are joined together after the collision. Ignore the effects of friction. Okay, and then they're showing us the before collision and after collision. Question 3.1 says, state the principle of conservation of momentum in words. Okay, I think you're all experts at that now. So previously we said that the total linear momentum in an isolated system is constant. Another way we can say it is the total linear momentum And I'm going to say in an isolated system, before collision, oops, is equal to Total linear momentum in an isolated system before collision is equal to the total linear momentum after collision. Okay, so whichever way you say it, as long as you're saying isolated system and you are saying that it is constant. Okay, so for two marks. Okay, the next question is, calculate the magnitude of the velocity of the cars after the collision. Okay, so there's one common velocity V, so they want us to find V. So we can do that. We start by writing the principle of conservation of linear momentum, which says, the total momentum before is equal to the total momentum after. Oh, and then they said it is moving to the right. So I'm going to say, take the right to be positive. Okay. Um, should have said that already. Okay, take right as positive. Okay, so what is the initial momentum? So it is mass of car one, V of car one, initially, plus mass of car two, V of car two, initially. That must equal to, the final momentum is just mass of one plus the mass of two, times V. Okay, so the equation is easier in this case. Okay, when we have that, now we need to substitute the values. Okay, so mass one is 92 times 10 to the three. And V1 is 1.3 meters per second. Okay. And M2, oh, that was M2. Okay, let me just. Uh, M1, M1, car one is 65. 
Oh my goodness, this sorry guys, sorry. In the drawing here, it's car two and then car one. Oops. Okay, so they've got car two first and then car one, so. So car one is 65. Sixty-five and V one is zero point eight. Okay, zero point eight and M two is ninety-two times ten to the three, and V two is one point three. Okay, and that has to equal to M one, which is sixty-five. times 10 to the three plus 92 times 10 to the three and V is what we're trying to find. Okay, so if you put this into your calculator, you should get 171600 on this side and 157 times 10 to the three V. Okay. And so V is just 1.09 meters per second. Okay, and it's positive, so it's to the right, but we <clears throat> already know that. Okay, so that's how we calculate the magnitude of the velocity of the cars after the collision. Excuse me. Okay. Okay, the next question is, for five marks, determine by means of appropriate calculations whether the collision between the two cars is elastic or inelastic. Okay, so we know that they got stuck together. So this is a completely inelastic collision. We know that. But by means of appropriate calculations, you need to determine that. So now we have to go to our theory and to understanding how can we show that this, how can we determine if it's elastic or inelastic? How would we know that? Okay, so if it was an elastic collision, then the total energy before will equal to the energy after. In this case, in our case of the kinetic energy. So the initial kinetic energy if it's equal to the final kinetic energy, it means we have an elastic collision. If they are different, then it's an inelastic collision. So that's the way to calculate it. So we have to now go and calculate what is the initial kinetic energy. Okay, what is the initial kinetic energy? So the initial kinetic energy is a half m1 v1 squared plus a half m2 v2 squared. Okay, so let's do the calculation. So that's equal to a half m1 is 65 times 10 to the 3 and v1 was 0 0.8 squared okay let's to write this out neatly plus a half m2 is 95 times 10 to the three and V2 is just 1.3 squared. And then you should get 98, 540 joules. 
for the initial kinetic energy. Okay, and then now you do the same thing. Now we go and find what is the final kinetic energy. The final kinetic energy is a half and it's M1 plus M2 V squared. Okay, because they got stuck together. So if we put that into the equation, M1 is 65 times 10 to the three plus, oh sorry, it was 92 all over and I'm saying, okay. It's 92 times 10 to the three and V we just calculated as 1.09. So 1.09 squared. If you put that into your calculator, you get 93.266 if we round it off, joules. Okay, so we've calculated the initial kinetic energy and the final kinetic energy. And you can see that the initial kinetic energy is not equal to the final kinetic energy. So therefore, this collision is inelastic. Okay, so that is how you answer that question. Okay, so I think we've covered all the possibilities. We've done many different examples and many practice questions on momentum. Okay, so now let's just move on to um, calculations with the Doppler effect. Okay, Doppler one. Okay, so here's our first question on the Doppler effect. A sound source moving at a constant speed of 240 meters per second towards a detector emits sound at a constant frequency. The detector records a frequency of 5,100 hertz. Take the speed of sound in air as 340 meters per second. Okay, state the Doppler effect. And then they want us to calculate the wavelength. So when we get these questions on the Doppler effect, I want you to read through the questions, always just writing down what information is given to us. For example, a sound source moving at a constant speed of 240 meters per second. So we know that is Vs. So you must just write it there as Vs. And it's moving towards the detector. Sorry. Okay, it's moving towards the detector. And then you know that if the source is moving towards the detector, the detector is going to record a much higher frequency. So all the things that we know about it, while you're reading the question, you must just make notes. So when we do the calculation, we must go back and check, oh, is this correct? Does it make sense? Okay, so let's start. State the Doppler effect. So we're talking about sound. What is the Doppler effect? Okay, so we'll write it out for this one, this example, and then we're not going to write it out. So what is the Doppler effect? So it's an apparent change an apparent change in the frequency or in the observed frequency. In an apparent change in the observed frequency as a result of the relative motion relative motion between what?
the source and an observer. Okay, so you'll see that this is different from what I did in the slides before. And there are many different ways of stating the Doppler effect. So you can also just write it out on your own, but you need to say that there's a source of sound and then there's an observer and there's relative motion between the two of them. So we're going to detect an apparent change in the observed frequency or in the pitch or in the wavelength. Okay, so you, you must know it. So now calculate the wavelength of the sound emitted by the source. Okay, so for us to calculate the wavelength of the sound emitted by the source, we need to know what is the frequency of the source. Because if we have the frequency, then we can calculate the wavelength. Okay, so that's the first thing we need to do. So we're gonna start off by using the equation, uh, the Doppler equation now to find the frequency of the source. Okay, so let's do that. So we know that FL is equal to, so the source is moving and the observer is stationary, okay? So we'll just have V, there's no speed for the observer. And in the bottom we have V and we have VS times FS. And they told us that the source is moving towards the detector. So that's a negative sign, okay? Once we have that, we're trying to find FS, but we can just fill in the values now. Uh, what did they say? They said, the detector records a frequency of 5,100 Hertz. Speed of sound in A is 340 and the source is moving at 240 meters per second. So we can just put all those values in. Okay, so you do it now. The frequency that the listener observes is 5,100 Hertz. They said to use 340 meters per second. So 340, and that is, the source is moving at 240. We're trying to find FS. Okay, so I'll just write it as FS is equal to two, 340 minus 240 is just 100. And just divide that by 340. And you should get 1000. 500 hertz. Okay, so the answer we get should be smaller than what the listener or the detector, um, what was detected, okay? So the detector recorded 5,100 hertz, but the source was only at 1,500 hertz. So as long as this value is less than 5,100, we are happy. Okay, so if you know what the frequency of the source is, can you calculate what the wavelength is. Okay, so the equation that we know is V is equal to F times lambda. Okay, the speed is equal to frequency times the wavelength. The speed is 340 meters per second. The frequency is 1500. And we are trying to calculate the wavelength lambda. Okay, so then lambda is equal to 340 divided by 1,500, which is equal to 0 0.23 meters. That is the wavelength of the source, okay? So that's how you do that one. And then the next question is, some of the sound waves are reflected from the detector towards the approaching source. Okay, so you have a source and the source is moving towards the detector. Some of the waves are reflected from the detector and then they approach the source. 
will the frequency of the reflected sound wave detected by the source be equal to greater than or smaller than 5,100? Now, 5,100 is what the detector is getting. So what do you think the answer is to that? So for 6.3, You've got your uh, source here, okay? If I can, no, let's just, here is your source and the sound's going out of there. And then here is a detector, okay? So the sound waves from here, the sound waves are going out like that. Okay, and so, and this source is moving that way. And this is your detector. So when, when the waves come here, the detector, oh, sorry. When the waves come here, your detector is recording 5,100 Hertz. Now, some of these sound waves, when they come here, they reach the detector, so it reaches the detector and it is reflected. So now it's this, this same one here, now bounces off and it's going back this way. It's going towards the source again. So when it gets to the source here, what kind of frequency will the source detect relative to 5,100? The question is, will it be equal to greater than or smaller than the 5,100? What do you think the answer is? Okay, well, the answer is it will be greater than. Because remember, in this case, these red waves now, these waves are moving in this direction and the source is also moving towards it. They are moving towards each other. So you are going to get a higher frequency. And this case here where you've got the source waves being reflected back to the source, this is called a double Doppler effect, okay? Okay, so that answers that question. Uh, I'm just going to go on to the next question because if you have any questions or comments, then you're going to stop me. Okay. Okay, so let's do Doppler 2. An ambulance with its siren on moves at a constant velocity towards a person standing next to the road. The person measures a frequency which is 110% of the frequency of the source emitted by the siren of the ambulance. Okay, name and state the phenomenon observed above. Okay, so we are running out of time now and I don't want to write again. So we know that the phenomenon is the Doppler effect and you can write it out as the change in frequency of the sound detected by a listener because the sound source and the listener have different velocities relative to the medium of sound propagation. As an example, that's one way that you could write it or the way we did for the example before. Okay, 6.2, if the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second, calculate the speed of the ambulance. Okay, so they're not giving us too much, but they did tell us that the person measures a frequency which is 110% of the frequency of the sound emitted by the siren. Okay, so for 6.2, the equation is the frequency that the listener hears is just V over V, V S, F S, and an ambulance moves at constant velocity 
towards the person. The source is moving towards the person. That's a negative sign in the denominator. Okay, so what is the frequency that the listener here? So they told us that it's 110%. So that's 110 out of 100 of the frequency of the source. Okay, so 110% of the frequency of the source is equal to, they said use 340 for V, 340 minus VS is what I'm trying to find. And I've got FS here. Okay, so this is what we have. We've got FS on both sides of the equation. You can use whichever math tricks you know, and we need to solve here for Vs. So we can just write it as 110 into 340 minus Vs on that side of the equation. And on this side of the equation, it's going to be 340 times 100. So just cross multiplying it. Okay. And from here, you can solve for Vs. So Vs is equal to, so 110 to 340 minus 100 times 340 divided by 110, okay? And the speed you get is 30.91 meters per second. Okay, that's the S. So that is the speed of the ambulance. Okay. Uh, the question is, the next question is, um, how will the frequency measured by the person be affected if the speed of the ambulance is increased? If the speed of the ambulance is increased, then how will the frequency change? So here's the equation. I'm oh, sorry. This is the equation. Okay, if Vs gets bigger, if Vs gets bigger in this equation here, so if Vs gets bigger, then this denominator is going to get smaller. Okay, so if Bs gets bigger here, what will happen to Fl? So if this gets bigger, then this, can you see that because this is in the denominator, that if it increases, then Fl is going to increase. Okay, because if this gets bigger, then you're dividing V by a bigger number. Let me just write this out here. This was uh, for 6.3. 6.3, um, write only, write only increase, decrease, or remain the same. So if the speed of the ambulance increases, what will happen to FL? So the answer is that it will increase, okay? And if you can see, you've got FL is equal to, and you've got the V over V minus Vs in the denominator there. So if Vs gets bigger, the frequency that you, yeah, the, the frequency that the listener records will also get bigger. Okay. Okay, we can definitely do this next example. Okay, do you have any question on that? 
sorry. Okay, let's just do this last example. Okay, so a learner in a car moving at a constant speed of 10 meters per second along a straight horizontal road records the frequency of sound emitted by a distant stationary source. The learner then repeats the recording of the frequency of the sound when the car travels at a new constant speed of 20 meters per second. The graph below, not drawn to scale, is obtained from the results. Okay, so if we look at this graph, you've got on the y-axis, the recorded frequency, and on the x-axis, the speed of the car. So when, when the speed of the car is 10 meters per second, you can see the frequency is 679.1. And when the speed of the car is 20 meters per second, then the frequency is 658.2. Okay, so the car is moving at a constant speed and the source is stationary somewhere. Okay, you've got a stationary source somewhere and then the car is moving. And these are the recorded frequencies. Okay, so state the Doppler effect for 6.1. We already know what the Doppler effect is. We've said it too many times now. Okay. Okay, 6.1, that's the definition. Okay, 6.2, use the graph to answer the following questions. Okay, so 6.2.1, write down the frequency of the sound emitted by the stationary source. Okay, so how do we know what is the frequency of the stationary source? <clears throat> so if we look at the, draw, uh, at the graph, the speed of the car at zero. So the speed of the car at zero means that the observer is not moving. So when the speed of the car is zero, then that will be the frequency of the source, <clears throat> okay? So if you look at the graph, when the speed of the car is zero, <clears throat> excuse me, when the speed of the car is zero meters per second, the graph shows us 700 Hertz. So that is, That is the frequency of the source. So 6.2.1, the frequency of the source emitted by the, the frequency of the sound emitted by the stationary source is 700 Hertz because this is where the listener is stationary, okay? The source is also stationary, but listener is stationary. Okay, this is the ARY, station ARY, stationary. Okay, the next question is, oh, oh, so for two marks, we have to say 700 Hertz, and then this doesn't go in brackets, this is answering the question, okay, because the listener is stationary. Okay, 6.2.2. In which direction is the car moving relative to the source. So you must choose from towards or away from and give a reason. Okay, so, so here is the graph. So the source is emitting a sound at 700 Hertz. And then the readings we are getting are 679.1 and 658. So the readings that we are recording is less than the frequency of the source. So what does that tell you? It tells you that whoever is detecting this is moving away from, okay? So the answer is away. And my reason is 
I'll write it on the next line, is that the observed frequency is less than the frequency of the source. Observed frequency is less than frequency of the source. Okay, or you can say that the uh, observed frequency decreases. And now, oh, look at this question. Calculate the speed of sound in air. Okay, so this one is a little bit different because normally they tell us what the speed of sound in air is and they'll ask you for speed of the listener or speed of the source. Now they want you to calculate the speed of sound in air. Okay, so for us to do that, you will have to use the graph now to choose the values for FL and FS. So you could choose whichever one. You could use where the speed is 10 meters per second. So we could use the VS as 10 and the frequency as 679. Or you could use the speed of 20 and the frequency of 658.2. Okay, so let's let's do this. We'll choose one, 6.2.3. We know that FL is equal to V, and we have VL. The source is not moving. And we know that the listener is moving away from the source, so that's a negative sign. Okay, that's what we know. But now, and we also know the frequency of the source, right? So which values are we going to use for VL and FL? You can choose whichever. Let's just use the 679.1. So 679.1 and the speed is 10 meters per second. Okay, so 679.1 is equal to, and now we don't know what V is because that's what we're trying to, calculate, they want us to calculate the speed of um, sound in air. So it's V minus 10 divided by V and the frequency of the source is 700 Hertz. Okay, so once you've got this part, now you must solve for V. If we just multiply it out here, we can get 679.1 V is equal to 700 V minus 7,000, okay? And then 700 V minus 679.1 V is equal to 7,000 just by Rearranging this equation, you'll get V is equal to 7,000 divided by 20.9. You don't have to do all these steps. And then you get 334.9 meters per second. Okay. And when we see this value, 334.9, it's reasonable because most often we will take the speed of sound in air to be 340 meters per second. So 334.9, it looks about right. So we're happy with that. Okay, so we will stop here. Um, do you have any questions? Anything you want to ask? Okay, so then I can just, gonna stop sharing my screen now. Ashla, can you also stop the video? I lost network, so when I came back, I wasn't the host anymore. Okay.